Well, here we are, brethren, on the final service of the seventh day of this particular festival. We noted this morning particularly the example of King Hezekiah and the fact that Passover signaled a time of the rededication of God's people. Now, it's interesting that as you go through the Bible, you find that the Bible is replete with the fact that there are ups and downs in the story of the people of God. There are times of revival and there are times of decay. We find that has been true in the overall sense as applied to the people of God. And we also find in our own lives, as we examine our lives, since the time that you were baptized, has your life just been a completely steady stream of onward and upward that you started and you have gone uh, just every day, uh, in every way, better and better? That, that hasn't been the story. Has it been a little more sort of like this? Now, hopefully, the overall trend is up, but you know, sometimes we fall into our slumps. We find ourselves not really where we know we ought to be. Things happen. Things come along. Life takes its toll. We read the story in 2 Kings chapter 20 about Hezekiah. And God spared his life and added 15 years to his life. And then Hezekiah died, as we're told in 2 Kings 20, verse 21. Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years. And we're told in verse 2 that he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now here, Hezekiah had led the nation in revival. And God had added years to his life. And part of what came along in those years was little Manasseh, who the nation of Judah would have been better off without. Uh, you know, sometimes it goes that way. We... we, we uh, what we think can be, what we think is a blessing can sometimes uh, have, uh, you know, contain within it uh, the, the kernel of certain problems and, and difficulties. And sometimes what we think is a terrible calamity uh, actually uh, contains the seeds of some of our greatest blessings. I think we can a lot of times look at that and realize that something we thought was terrible, uh, in the aftermath of it, we recognize what God was working out. Well, Manasseh came along, we're told in, in uh, 2 Kings 21, 2, he did that which was evil after the abominations of the nations. Uh, verse 3, built up again the high places which his father had destroyed, reared up altars for Baal, like his grandfather, worshipped all the host of heaven. Verse 4, built altars in the house of, of the eternal. Uh, built altars, verse 5, for the host of heaven. Uh, verse 6, made his son pass through the fire, observed times, used enchantments, dealt with familiar spirits, wizards, wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Uh, you, you know, Manasseh would have been hard-pressed to have come up with something he didn't do. If it was bad, I mean, he tried everything. He, he was uh, sort of the epitome of the uh, uh, rebellious kid that came along. He was going to do the opposite of everything Dad did. And he did. Uh, so we notice uh, in verse 7, he set up a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house uh, of which the Lord said to Solomon and to David in this house, I have chosen. Verse 8, neither God had told them, neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers, only if they will observe to do all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. I would call your attention here that there are two laws. A lot of you know, Protestant world doesn't understand that. God said, according to all that I commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. There were two laws. The law of God and the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses was based upon the law of God, but it, in, it included much of the ceremonial uh, things and, and was based upon, it would involve the application uh, of the law of God. The spiritual part of it was the law of God, the things that God directly commanded them. He spoke the words of the Ten Commandments himself. Moses uh, gave them many of the other things. 
But anyway, they hearkened not. Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the, the, the children of Israel. Now, you notice two things here. Manasseh got off the track, and that was bad. He was the leader, and he should have been the one that would have helped the people. He was the leader. He got off the track, but you notice something? The people followed him. Now, when the punishment came, did the punishment just come on Manasseh and the people escaped? Because, after all, they were just following orders. No, you don't find that. You find the leader has the most accountability. That's why James said, you know, don't many of you desire to be teachers, don't desire to be many masters, knowing that we shall receive the sterner judgment, the stricter judgment. Those who are responsible for teaching and guiding others are more accountable. But those that are taught are accountable also. We all have to stand and take responsibility. And so we find that the people who had had the witness of Hezekiah's life, and it hasn't been that, that many years. You see, it's only been a matter, by the time Manasseh took the throne, it had only been a matter of 15 years since God had delivered the nation with a tremendous miracle. Can you imagine 187,000 people being uh, slaughtered in one night by an angel? to deliver the nation from what seemed sure destruction. Don't you think people were all excited and all charged up and, and boy, faith was high. But how long did it last? Here we are, you know, we come on down 15 years down the road. Hezekiah dies, a new king comes along, and within a few years, we find people, many of whom were certainly old enough to have remembered, many of whom could have even remembered Hezekiah's great Passover of revival, And we find that they got off the track. Well, God said in verse 12, I'm bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever hears of it, both his ears shall tingle. You know, there comes a point when God has enough. And he says, I am going to deal with them. And there's not going to be any question. Well, we find in verse 16, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. He did all kinds of things. And then in verse 18, he died. And uh, his son, Ammon, came along, reigned a couple of years, and did that which was evil, and he died. And then we find, in chapter 22, verse 1, that there was a little eight-year-old boy, Manasseh's grandson, who was eight, when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years. Verse 2, he did that which was right in the sight of the eternal, walked in all the ways of David his father, turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. That... In the 18th year uh, of, the, of King Josiah, that uh, and they began the repair, as here he was, a, uh, a, a young man. They began to repair the breaches, began to build up the, uh, uh, the temple once again. And in the course of this, of repairing the temple, which had been shut down, they found something very important. Hilkiah the priest, in verse 8 of chapter 22, said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the eternal. Now, there had been an attempt during the days of Manasseh to destroy the Bible. The Bible is the book. Men have sought to destroy, they've tried to burn it, they have banned it, they have burned it, they have tried to ignore it, they have condemned it, they have done everything they could to try and destroy the Word of God, and yet the Word of God has remained and has continued. God has preserved His Word down through time. So here was Manasseh having tried to destroy the Bible, but there was a copy of the Book of the Law that had been secreted in the temple, some place, and in the process of cleansing the temple, they found the book of the law. They found the Bible. Remember, you know, at this point in time, there weren't multiple Bibles all over the place because every copy of the scripture had to be copied by hand. Manasseh had obviously tried to destroy every copy that he could. There may be portions that remained, but here was an entire copy, the official copy of the book of the law. And so they brought this, verse 9, they brought this, word to the king. And uh, they, uh, shape in the scribe, verse 10, showed the king, and he said, Hilkiah the priest has delivered me a book. 
And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. Now, you know why? He knew they were in trouble, but he didn't know how much until he heard the book of the law. And then he found all the curses listed in the book of the law. He found all, he, he knew they were in trouble, but he didn't know how much. And so he is greatly moved when he hears the book of the law. And the king uh, commanded Hilkiah the priest and the others, and he said, verse 13, Go inquire of the eternal for me, and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book. For great is the wrath of the eternal that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all which is written concerning us. You see, Hilkiah, uh, Josiah recognized that there was an obligation of the people to obey the terms of the covenant. And as he had the Bible read to him, that portion, the book of the law, he recognized how far short they had fallen. So we find in chapter 23, verse 1, the king sent, they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up into the house of the eternal and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, the priests and the prophets and all the people, small and great. He read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Now you think you've heard some long sermons. He started with Genesis 1-1 and he went all the way through to the end of Deuteronomy. Now I didn't say he did it in, uh, without stop, but... Uh, he went through and he read them all the book of the law. This is a starting point. You see, a revival of the truth has to center on the word of God. You don't just revive on the basis of sort of what seems good, what feels good, uh, just sort of sentiment and emotion. Now, Mr. Litchfield in the sermonette focused in on sincerity and truth. And where did Josiah start? He started with the truth. Now notice what he said. Verse 3, the king stood by a pillar and he made a covenant before the eternal to walk after the eternal to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book and all the people stood to the covenant. You see, the king took a stand. He read the people the law. He said, this is what God says. You have to start with God's commands. He started with what God said and he said, now as for me, I'm going to follow what God says with all my heart, with all my soul, with everything that is within me, with my emotions and with my thoughts. What it means, with all your heart, with all your soul with your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your attitudes, with everything that constitutes the inner person. He said, I want to serve God. Now, we don't just serve God according to the dictates of our imagination. You know, they say the, the dictates of your conscience. Your conscience has to be educated. Uh, you know, I read... Uh, You've seen all of this in the news about the mad cow disease and everything. Evidently, there was something very similar, a uh, similar type of disease that uh, had existed down in some of the South Sea Islands uh, back several years ago. And I guess they had done some research and they found that those, that, that particular disease in that area was uh, isolated to people who had practiced ritual cannibalism. And that, that was the means by which that had been transmitted. Now, the point that I'm making is, you know, if they had, they let their conscience be their guide and their conscience didn't stop them from doing things like that, did it? You see, their conscience wasn't educated to the truth of God. People all over the world do all kinds of things. If our conscience is our guide, we're in bad shape because our conscience has to be educated. If your conscience isn't educated to the truth, then you just do whatever it is that... Uh, uh, you, you know, as the song says, doing what comes naturally. Well, if you do what comes naturally, you just do what everybody else does, and if others around you are doing it, well, it must seem like a pretty good idea. So Josiah started with the law. He made a covenant in the sight of the people. And 
we find that he began then to carry out, he, uh, verse 5, he put down the idolatrous priest. That was the starting point. He started cleaning house. He started with the leadership. Cleaned uh, with all, he started with the idolatrous priests. Uh, he brought out, verse 6, the grove out of the house of the eternal. And we find that he burned it and stamped it to powder and cast the powder uh, upon the graves of the children of the people, the ones who had uh, uh, been involved in that. He broke down the houses of the sodomites. That sort of sounds like they had some problems back then, sort of like what we have going on today. You know, they had the gay liberation movement or whatever uh, they had back there. They did under King Manasseh. They didn't under Josiah, though. Uh, he... Uh, He broke down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Eternal, where the women wrote, wove hangings for the groves. I mean, this was just incredible. Here, this was right here at the temple. He brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense. We find all the things that he did. Uh, verse 14, he broke in pieces the images, cut down the groves, filled their places with the bones of men. And... Uh, uh, even certain prophecies that were fulfilled. In verse 19, all the houses of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took those away too, and he did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. He slew the priests of the high places that were before the altars, burned uh, men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the eternal your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. There's not been holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Judah, nor the days of the kings of, of Israel. But they held the Passover in the 18th year of King Josiah. And we find uh, uh, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and the abominations. Uh, he put those things away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the eternal with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. According to the law, all the law of Moses, neither arose there any after. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath. You see, God said, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it in the days of Josiah. Because you see, the people conform to Josiah's reform. Josiah turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. But it's very apparent when you read the account here and you read it in Second Chronicles, the people did not. They conformed to Josiah's regulations. Josiah said, I'm going to set things back on track. And he moved with great emphasis and zeal. He was a young man and he had the zeal of youth. And he was zealous once he took the thumb to begin to get things back on track. And when he recognized what the law of God said, he turned to it with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. That's what we're told. Now, you remember Jesus Christ said, that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. That is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Josiah was an example of absolute wholehearted zeal and we find that this reform culminated in the celebration of a great Passover, a great Passover that was such as had not been celebrated in all the days of the history of the nation since the days of the judges. Now, Chronicles, the account in Chronicles makes it plain, specifically since when it says that uh, in uh, Second Chronicles, uh, 35.1, Josiah kept the Passover unto the eternal in Jerusalem. They killed the Passover on the, 14th, on the 14th day of the first month. We're told in verse 18, there was no Passover kept like that in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept and the priests and the Levites and all Judah. Again, the Passover and the days of unleavened bread were a key part of a great revival among the people of God. But in this particular case, it is apparent that it was a revival in Josiah's case. Josiah turned to the Lord with all of his heart. The people got in line with the program. 
But if you go on through the story and you can read it and you can go back to the book of Jeremiah and other places, you find out that the people didn't get on track in their hearts. In their hearts. And you see, that is the crucial thing. We find the story over and over that the people have tended to respond to leaders whether they be good or bad. Most people. There have always been those who have seen beyond the human leader. And if a man was a man who was faithful to God and was God's true servant, they gave him their support and they followed him as he followed God. But over and over what we've seen is that people have been all too apt to just go with the flow. To just bend with the wind. Now let's go back to the book of Exodus. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 6. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the eternal. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There's no leavened bread to be seen with you. Neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all of your quarters. Now we have eaten unleavened bread for seven days. And in the seventh day is a feast to the eternal. And we're here for a feast. We've had a physical feast at noon. We uh, have been here to uh, be a part of a spiritual festival. uh, In the morning and in the afternoon. So here we are on this seventh day. Which is to be a feast. Now, as we come on down through the story, we find that in verse 17, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. God said, for adventure, the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up earnest out of the land of Egypt. They went up by five and a rank. They went up in an organized, orderly way. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he, Joseph, had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Now this is an interesting thing, because you see, when Joseph died in Egypt, he believed God. God had promised that Israel, the descendants of Israel, would ultimately come back into the promised land and inherit. Now, when Jacob had died, he was taken and buried there uh, in the cave that uh, uh, Abraham had purchased to bury his wife, Sarah, and had become the family burial plot. And Jacob was taken up and was buried there. Joseph, when he died, said, no, I want to go to the promised land. You see, Joseph died in faith. And he told them as, he, as they gathered around his bed, he said, when the, when the children of Israel, when our people leave Egypt and go to the promised land, I want you to take me with you. I'll be buried here in Egypt. But you take my body, you take my coffin, and you bring it with you so that I also might enter the promised land. Joseph died in faith, believing that God would deliver the nation and would bring them into the promised land and give it to them as he had promised. So the bones of Joseph were taken with them. In verse 20, they took their journey from Sokoth, camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way. He didn't take the pillar of cloud didn't take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. Then God spoke to Moses, and he told them to tell the children of Israel to turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. And God knew, you see, he knew what Pharaoh would do, and Pharaoh would look at this, he had his spies checking on things, and would say, they have got, they're in a mess, they're entangled in the wilderness, Uh, They're not going to be able to get out of there. I'm going to come down. You see, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. How did he harden his heart? Did God make Pharaoh do it against his will? No. God allowed circumstances to develop where Pharaoh 
saw a way to do what Pharaoh wanted to do. You know, if you really want to do something sooner or later, you probably have the opportunity. Pharaoh really wanted to not let the people go and to do what uh, he wanted to do. So sure enough, God allowed him to get the situation. Pharaoh looked at it and said, I've got them now. Now, you, you have to conclude Pharaoh was not real swift on the uptake. I mean, we've already gone through all these plagues uh, and, and the whole nation has been devastated. And somehow Pharaoh thinks he's got them trapped down there and he's going to really make up for lost time now. Pharaoh's sort of like these, you know, he's almost like one of these uh, characters on the cartoons, you know, that after the anvil dropped on him and everything else that happens, he keeps going back for more. Uh, and, and Pharaoh was a little bit like that. So Pharaoh decided that uh, uh, he was going to get his uh, uh, his chariots together and go down there. Now, the uh, we find that he took, in verse 7, 600 chosen chariots and then all the chariots of Egypt and the captains. Now we find in verse 8, the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Verse 9, but the Egyptians pursued after them. And when Pharaoh drew near, verse 10, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. Or they were coming out. Now they had seen all these miracles. They had seen the intervention of God. They'd seen the death angel pass over. They'd seen the water turn to blood. They'd seen all of these things. They had seen God's deliverance. They came out with a high hand. Now, all of a sudden, they found out there were problems. And we look at that and we shake our head and say, I can't. How could they do that? Brethren, how many times in your life and my life, how many times has God delivered us? How many prayers has he answered? How many times over the years has God intervened? And we knew it was God. And then we come up facing some sort of crisis. And we get scared. It's like, no, wait a minute. Now, God delivered us from this. He delivered us from that. He saw us through this problem. He got us through this crisis. And, uh, you know, it may be this personal problem and this health problem and this financial difficulty and this thing and that thing. These prayers, God has answered. God did that. And now, all of a sudden, we've got a crisis and I'm scared to death. What in the world am I going to do? It's all going to come crashing down on Isn't it amazing how much of an elusive quality faith seems to be sometimes? Boy, we can come through something and we're on a high and I, we just know that God is there. We've experienced a miracle. We've experienced an answer to prayer and, and we have that confidence and all of a sudden, a day or two later or a week later or whatever it is, something, something happened. We're confronted with some crisis and it's like our faith just sort of melts. And all of a sudden, here we are, we're scared again. We think, oh no, what kind of mess am I in? What am I going to do? And this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and then what? And then I really want to know what to do. And pretty soon, we're living off of all sorts of borrowed trouble. I saw a little sign one time years ago, and I guess the reason it registered with me is because I was uh, anxious about some things. I had received a phone call, and I was... Uh, had uh, quite a bit of uh, worry and just uh, I'd gone to make a visit but this phone call was on my mind and I was turning all this stuff over in my mind and I, I, I saw a sign on, on the wall it said worry is the interest you pay on troubles you borrow." and I realized as I looked at that little wall plaque that I was sure paying a high rate of interest about that time I had borrowed all kinds of trouble and uh, you know, the thing I was worried about never did come to pass. I never heard another word about it. But you see, we find ourselves in that spot. We find they were sore afraid. Their faith just sort of melted away. First thing they did was get scared, begin to cry out to God, and then they looked for somebody to blame. And Moses was the closest one, and so he got the blame. Amazing, you know, we, we like to have somebody to blame. Somehow it just seems a little better if we can us at somebody about it. Uh, they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. Thought there was a grave shortage back there, that's why we're out here. Why have you dealt with us this way? Now, when they'd been back in Egypt, they had been crying out to God for deliverance. Now they were out, and they said, we're in trouble. Didn't we tell you, verse 12, when we were in Egypt, didn't we tell you when you first came, just let us alone. Don't, don't make any more trouble for us. 
It's better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Now those are three important keys. Fear not. You see, when fear takes over our lives, it does one of two things. When fear is in control of your life, it produces either panic or paralysis. Some people get panicked by fear and they just uh, act irrationally. They go charging off this way, that way, some other way. They're just panicked by fear and and, and it's like something sort of short circuits and they, uh, they, they just do something. Others become just paralyzed. They're immobilized by their fear and they... They're so fearful of making the wrong decision, they can't make any decision. They just stand there. Sort of like, uh, you know, somebody crossing the road and all of a sudden here's the traffic coming toward them and, and they're so paralyzed with fear, they just stand there. They can't decide which way to run, so they just stand there and get run over from both directions. He says, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the eternal. You know, there is a point where you have to put it in God's hands and just watch and see what God does. And so Moses said, God will show you. The Egyptians whom you've seen today, you're not going to see them again. The Lord will fight for you and you'll hold your peace. And so we find that uh, the pillar of fire We're told in verse 19 and 20, separated the Egyptians from the Israelites. This was at night, as we're told in the end of verse 20. No one came uh, came not near the other all the night. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord caused the sea to go back with a strong east wind all that night. And he made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went up out of the midst of the sea upon dry land. Now this was the equivalent of last night. This was the night that began the last holy day of the Days of Unleavened Bread. It took them seven days to come out of Egypt. You can go through the details of it. I, for the sake of time, I'm not. But uh, uh, it took them seven days to come out of Egypt. And as they came out of Egypt, or as they came there to the Red Sea that final night, confronted by the armies of Pharaoh on the one side and the, De- and the Red Sea on the other, God opened up the sea, and he brought them across. You see, sometimes the way God delivers us is not the way that we would have imagined. I'm sure people had different ideas when Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Well, they probably had all kinds of ideas as to how God would do it. Who who among them do you think guessed that he would open the sea? Maybe they thought he would send an angel and smite the Egyptian army. The death angel would pass back through. You know, they could have come up with all sorts of scenarios. The the thing is, you see, none of us have been called to be God's script writer. God doesn't need a script writer. He has his plan and his purpose in mind. And all of us, at one time or another, we sort of volunteer to write the script. And then sometimes we get upset because God didn't read his lines. At least not the way we wrote them. We had in mind the way we wanted him to solve the problem. We had it all figured out. One, two, three. And he didn't choose to do it that way. Because you see, the point is, God is God. And God will do it the way God chooses to do it. And what we need to do is, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I don't, I doubt that any of them ever thought about opening up the Red Sea. Why would they think of that? Oh, God, maybe he'll do it this way. Maybe he'll do it that way. Well, God did it in a way that probably came as a surprise. He opened up the Red Sea. They walked across. The Egyptians stood and watched, and they were sort of impressed by that. And they thought, well, I guess if they can do it, we can too. Oh, that wasn't uh, the case. Uh, You find that uh, uh, verse 24 of chapter 14, that came to pass in the morning, Watch, the Lord looked upon the host of Egypt through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians, took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of the etern- from the face of Israel, uh, for the Lord fights for them. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand upon the sea and the waters may come together. And he stretched his hand and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. End of verse 27. The waters returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts. Here the Egyptians were, you know, they were really racing across the, uh, the, the Red Sea and then all of a sudden the wheels fell off the chariots. 
and they said, "Uh uh-oh, we're in trouble now. Let's turn around and head the other way. Well, it was too late. God was able to take care of them. So we find in verse 30 of chapter 14, the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Israel saw that great work which the Lord did. And the people feared the eternal and believed the eternal and his servant Moses. And then they sang this song of celebration, the song of Moses, uh, here in chapter 15. And yet we find that it wasn't very long. As we find in verse 22, when they were brought up from the Red Sea, went into the wilderness, went three days, and they found no water. And then they came to water, they came to Marah, where it was bitter. Could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And you know what happened? They murmured against Moses. There their attitudes began to go. Their attitude lasted about three days. They were in a good attitude about three days, but problems came along. Difficulties. And then you see they got their hopes up. You know what's worse than, than facing adversity and, and everything? It's when you think you see the solution. And then that's not it. Because your hopes have gone up and then boom, there they go down. They went along these three days and they were thirsty and they didn't know where they were going to get water and they must have been just about totally out. Somebody said, hey, there's water up ahead. And they raced up there and there was water. Then when somebody tasted it, it was bad. It was bad. Well, here they went from being worried to thinking they had the answer to knowing they didn't have the answer. And boy, their attitude went downhill. Uh, It was like, uh, you know, getting on a bicycle and heading down a big steep hill. They, They went down in a hurry. And they murmured. And they... Uh, they said, what are we going to drink? And so, Moses uh, went to God about it, and God told him to take a tree and cast it into the water, and the waters were made sweet. You see, God had a solution for the problem. But we find that instead of going to God, they murmured, they complained. Now, when you go back to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, we read that The things that happened to them were an example for us to the extent that we wouldn't do the things they did. They were confronted with problems and trials and adversities. God delivered them. The days of unleavened bread, the message of the days of unleavened bread, and particularly this final seventh day, is a message of deliverance. It's a message of deliverance. The God that we serve has a plan and a purpose for each of us individually, and he has a plan and a purpose for his work. God has a great plan and purpose that he's working out. But you know, all of us get sidetracked sometimes and we get confronted by problems and difficulties. We become discouraged. And we find as we go on through the story, over and over, some of the the tests and the trials. We find these days of unleavened bread introduced here and we find this first holy day introduced. Well, you know the story, they wandered the 40 years, and at the end of the 40 years, we come to the time where Moses died, and the children of Israel were to pass over into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Now, in Joshua chapter 1, we read, as Joshua was told in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land that I do give to them, even the children of Israel. So God said, get up and go forward. He told him in verse 6, be strong and of good courage, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous to observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You'll meditate therein day and night. Now, you remember, we started out by seeing where Josiah rediscovered the book of the law. The book that revealed the will of God. He said, don't let this book depart out of your mouth. Meditate in it day in and day out. Think about, meditate on God's word, God's will. Seek to be filled with the knowledge of the will and the way and the purpose of God. 
It was emphasized to Joshua as he was preparing to lead the people into the promised land that he had to be absolutely committed to going forward and to accomplishing what God had given him to do. It was going to take strength. It was going to take courage. It was going to take a commitment to what God had promised. It was going to take a commitment to the word of God, to really having that word in our heart, in our mind, in our thoughts. I told him in verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong, of a good courage, be not affrighted, neither be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you where you go. So we find that if we are going to go forward, if we're going to inherit the promises of God, if we're going to make good, what God has called us to, we have to be committed. We have to be completely committed. We have to be committed to going forward. That commitment involves commitment to God's word, to having God's word in our hearts and in our minds. And so we find that uh, as you go on through the story, they uh, came up to the point where they were going to cross the river. The city of Jericho was the great fortress city of the Canaanite Confederation. And it stood on the uh, west side of the Jordan River, and it was the place by where uh, by which the uh, Israelites would pass into the Promised Land. It was the fortress city that guarded the entrance into the land of Canaan. And so they were confronted with this that they had in this great fortress city, uh, how were they going to get past? Well, you remember the story. The spies came in and uh, they uh, came back and God told them what to do. And as we come on uh, through, God told, told uh, Joshua in chapter 3. Uh, Joshua got up early that morning. They removed, came to the Jordan and uh, uh, commanded the people, saying, verse 3, when you should see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, uh, you shall remove from your place and go after it. So he told them to follow the ark. Now, what did the ark contain? The ark contained the law of God. The ark was symbolic of the presence of God. It contained the tables of the covenant. It contained the law of God. So where do, what do you follow? You follow God's presence. And God's presence is where his truth is. Because the book of the law was deposited inside of the ark. You can read that back in Deuteronomy. Moses delivered uh, the uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, 26. Take this book of the law, Moses told them. Put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against you. So the book of the covenant was in the side of the ark. The people were told to follow the ark because the ark symbolized the presence of God. That's where the truth was. And so the people of God were instructed that they were to follow the truth. So he was told to do that. In verse 5, Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This is in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. and verse 6, Joshua spoke to the priest. He told them to take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on before the people. Now, it was important, you see, that the people do things in the right order. They followed the Ark. Some of them had gone wading into the Jordan first. They might have found themselves in trouble. But God was ready to deliver them across. Verse 11, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord... Uh, of all the earth passes on before you over the Jordan. So we find that uh, uh, the priests came forward and that uh, uh, the, uh, as the priests, uh, priests came forward, uh, that as they walked out into the river, the river began to part. And the priests walked in. He brings out uh, in uh, verse 14 of chapter 4, he magnified Joshua in the sight of the people. Now, in verse 19, the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And 
we find that uh, that the Israelites came up. Now, word of the of the what had happened at the Jordan spread quickly. Chapter five, verse one. Uh, the kings of the Amorites and the Canaanites and all the others heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan before the children of Israel, and their heart melted. Neither was there any spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. You know, word traveled fast. And uh, all of a sudden, the fight was going out of some of these folks. And then at that time, in verse 2, God told Joshua, Make knives of flint and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. You see, they had not been circumcised during the 40 years in the wilderness. That's what we're told in verse 5. People that came out of Egypt were circumcised, but the people that had been born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, had not been circumcised. Now, before the circumcision was the symbol of the covenant, and we're told under the new covenant that we are to be circumcised in the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. That. So, what we're looking at is conversion. We look first at commitment, then we look at conversion. There has to be a commitment, there has to be a conversion that took place. The people entered into this uh, covenant with God. They took upon themselves the sign of the covenant. And so this occurred. Then we're told in verse 10, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the, of the first month at Eden in the plains of Jericho. Did eat of the produce of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. Now, this, uh, if you go through, you can uh, uh, recognize that the, uh, uh, the Passover, uh, clearly at this point, was on a weekly Sabbath, because that way the first day of unleavened bread would have been on a Sunday, in which case it would have coincided with the day of the way sheep. If they were not free, we know that, because they weren't free to eat of the produce of the land, until the way sheep had been offered, and they ate on it on the morrow after the Passover. So that tells us then the first day of unleavened bread was on a Sunday, so it coincided with the way sheep. So they began to do this, and the manna ceased. And they came up to Jericho, and we find in chapter 6, verse 1, that Jericho was shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out. None came in. And so that uh, uh, they were confronted by this siege of the city of Jericho. They were confronted by something which was to, uh, well, as I think the Sonsino, uh, the Jewish commentary, makes a uh, uh, an interesting comment. They say modern excavations have shown that the walls of Jericho were not breached but sank down in their place as from the effect of an earthquake. The miraculous manner of uh, Jericho's capture was intended to emphasize to Israel at the outset of their task two thoughts. First, that God was with them, and second, that not by their own strength would they conquer. God was with them, and not by their own strength would would they conquer. You see, there had to be a commitment, there had to be conversion, there also had to be an awareness that it was only by the power of God that the job could be accomplished. Not by their own strength, not by their own power. They, they were confronted with a great fortress city that had a tremendous store of supplies laid up. The walls were tremendously thick. And what did God tell them to do? He told them, I want you to go out and walk around the wall. Walk around the city every day. And so they compassed the city. Uh, every day, went around it six days. This is Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. Compass the city, all the men of war going about the city once, this you, thus you shall do six days. Seven priests bearing seven ram horns before the ark. The seventh day, this day, you see, here we are, they kept the Passover, now here we are, the days of unleavened bread, and the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times. The priests shall blow with the horns, Make a long blast, 
When you hear the sound of the horn, all the people shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. So, this is exactly what happened. God sent them out. They, want, they went around the city every day. You can imagine, you know, the people in Jericho standing up here, sort of watching, scratching their heads, and wondering what are these guys doing, walking around, reach blow the ram horn, they go on back. And, you know, six days go by, and they come out, and they walk around the city. Somebody blows the horn. These people in Jericho must have been thinking, oh, you know, these guys are fatty. Something's wrong with them. Been out in the sun too long. Then on the seventh day, they get up there and they walk around it seven times. And they're thinking, these guys are going to get dizzy. Then the sound of the horn, the people shouted, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And the people went up and they possessed the city of Jericho. So we find that God's might and God's power was the key to victory. And that's a lesson that God wants all of us as his people to understand. God has called us to victory. But it's not by our strength and our might. It's not by our uh, endeavors and our machinations and our uh, all of our uh, somehow conniving and contriving that's going to carry it all out. We can all put in a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of thought on that. But you know, it's God who's going to do that. Now God gave them instructions through, Jer- through Joshua. He said in verse 18 of uh, chapter 6, You shall keep yourselves from the devoted thing, lest you make yourselves a curse by taking the devoted thing. See, Israel was told, you're not to loot Jericho. All the silver, all the gold, the vessels of brass and iron are holy to the Lord. They're to come into the treasury of the Lord. Well, what do we find? Chapter 7, verse 1, the children of Israel committed trespass concerning the devoted thing for Achan, the son of Carmi. He was of the tribe of Judah, and he took of the devoted thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Here was one individual, he was a leader among the people, and he took of the devoted thing. What we find is that sin has a contaminating influence. Here was sin in the midst. The people of God must be clean. They must be devoted to God. Here was one who took of the devoted thing. He treated lightly what God had said. And he brought a curse on the nation. God's blessing was removed. Uh, They had gone in by a great miracle. They had won the battle of Jericho. Now, there was a little village, a little place called Ai that was up the road a little ways uh, near Jericho. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just send a few fellows up there sort of do a mop-up operation on Ai. They were feeling pretty good about that time, not having really stopped to consider that they had very little to do with winning the Battle of Jericho. All they did was walk around the city. They did well as long as they followed instructions. But somehow along the line, like a lot of us, they got to thinking that somehow they had something to do with it, and they'd done pretty good. They could certainly take care of this little place. They wouldn't even have to bother to ask God about that one. It was just a little problem. They, they hadn't they just handled the big one, so they went up there to Ai and uh, said, uh, told Joshua in verse 3, they said, look, uh, let's not bother everybody about this. We'll just take two or 3,000 men. We'll just go up and smite Ai. We'll just, we'll take care of them. And so we find that uh, they went up there, about 3,000 men. In verse 4, they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai smote of them, about 36, and chased them from before the gate, and smote them at their descent, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Oh boy, the fight went out of them. I mean, all the starch was gone. They came back with their tail between their legs, and they were really upset. And here they had just uh, had been uh, defeated. Well, they were sort of cocky. They thought they had it in hand. And you see, they didn't have God's blessing. And Joshua goes through and consults God. And what it finally comes out to is that the people must be sanctified, verse 13. And uh, ultimately it comes out that, a- that Achan has stolen the, uh, the devoted thing. Achan told them in verse 21 of chapter 7 uh, that he saw the Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 
fifty shekels, and he says, I coveted them, and I took them, and there hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. And so we find that Achan, those that were involved in this thing with him, were stoned. There was a very serious matter. Sin is not a light thing. Sin has a contaminating influence. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The people of God must be clean. God had called Israel for a work. They were to go forward and they were to inherit the promised land. They were to be the people of God. There had to be commitment. There had to be conversion. There had to be an awareness of the need for God's power and God's strength. That was the only means by which they would conquer. But they also needed to learn a lesson that sin has a contaminating influence that spreads. And we see that that was the case. Now in the aftermath, Ai was burnt and people came forward. And we find that uh, they reiterated the covenant that they had made. That in chapter 8, verse 30, Joshua built an altar in Mount Ebal. And in verse 32, he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote before the children of Israel. And we find that uh, uh, all Israel and their elders and officers and judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, that bore the ark. And Israel... He, Joshua read, we're told in verse 34, the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that's written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua didn't read before all the assembly. The women, the little ones, and the strangers that walked with them. So, as we come on down, we are confronted with the people making a rededication to God. Now, as we come on through the story, we find that as they proceeded through, there came a battle after the, in chapter 10 and verse 5, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, of Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, gathered themselves together. And uh, so we find in verse 7, Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor, and the Lord said, don't fear, I've delivered them into your hand. And so, we're told Joshua came up upon them suddenly, verse 9, he went up from Gilgal all the night. And these people were chased. And yet, uh, verse 11, it came to pass as they fled from before Israel, uh, the Lord cast great stones from heaven down, great hailstones, and they died. And... Uh, uh, there were more that died with the hailstones than the children of Israel slew. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day that the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he asked for a miracle. Here is one of the most outstanding miracles that ever took place. We're told in verse, uh, we're told on down here in verse 13, the sun stayed in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. There was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the eternal thought for it. This is the story of Joshua's long day. Daylight was prolonged for 12 hours. A tremendous event. One of the most impressive, staggering miracles that our mind cannot, can barely comprehend. So we find that just as sin has a contaminating influence and when the people of God are polluted by sin and God's blessing is removed, there are going to be problem after problem after problem. We also find that when the people of God are pleasing to him, there is no limit to the power of God to intervene. The God that we serve is a miracle working God. And so there are some important lessons as we look at the book of Joshua, a book that celebrates the conquest of the promised land, a book that begins with the Passover season, 
tells the story of a great miracle that occurred on this day. We find that there is lesson after lesson contained in this book as we go forward. Because you see, we're called to be conquerors. Isn't, isn't that what we're told? One message that is in common to every one of the seven churches of Revelation, signifying the church of God for all time. You know, the seven candlesticks and the seven uh, lampstands. Christ pictures himself in Revelation 1 standing in the midst of. This represents the church in its entirety. And there are messages to each one of the churches symbolized by these lampstands. And there's one message that is repeated to every single church. It's repeated seven times. To him that overcomes. To him that conquers. That's repeated to each church now. Because that is one thing that is in common for all of God's people in all times. That God has called us to overcome. He's called us to conquer. Joshua is a conqueror. And the book of Joshua is a book of conquests. But for conquests to take place, there had to be commitment, there had to be conversion, there had to be reliance on God's power, there had to be the lesson learned that sin contaminates. It separates us from God and from God's blessing. And yet we go on to see that There is nothing that is too great for our God to accomplish if we're dedicated to him with our whole heart. Well, as we come on down through the story, we're not going to go through all the details of all the the conquest and how the land was allocated out. You find as you go through the story that it took them them six years to subdue the land, and in the seventh year they entered into God's rest. That's made plain when we find in Joshua 14, verses 9 and 10, uh, Caleb, who had been one of the original spies, you remember, that uh, along with Joshua had yet brought back the faithful report. Caleb told Joshua in, in Joshua 14, 10, uh, the Lord has kept me alive as he's spoken these 45 years from the time the Lord spoke this word unto Moses. And so he was asking for his promise. Now, if you remember, they were in the wilderness. They, they, it was one year after the Exodus when the spies were sent into the land. And now the story in 1410, uh, in chapter 14, verse 10, is 45 years later. So that would be 45 years after the spies went into the land, 46 years after the Exodus. It was 40 years in the wilderness and therefore six years in the land. And this is the point where now they are ready to enter into rest to inherit the promised land. And so, as we go on through the story and the details of the uh, the details of the conquest, we find that there are things yet uh, to there are things yet to be learned as we uh, uh, as we come on back. Chapter eighteen, verse one: The whole congregation assembled themselves at Shiloh. The land was subdued before them. And all the details of the allocation of the land is given. And we come on back now to sort of the end of the story back in Joshua chapter 23 verse 1. After many days when the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, Joshua was old and stricken in years. Joshua called all Israel and their elders and their heads. uh, He called them all together. He said in verse 3, You've seen what the Lord has done unto all these nations. He fought for you. I have allocated you an inheritance according to your tribes. Now, verse 5, the Lord your God, he'll thrust these nations out before you drive them from before your sight and you'll possess their land. Verse 6, therefore be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside from the right hand or to the left, that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods nor cause to swear by them, nor serve them, nor worship them, but cleave to the Lord your God as you've done this day. Because, verse 12, if you do in any wise go back and cleave to the remnant of these nations, make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, the Lord will not drive these nations out of your sight. They'll be a snare and a trap. Now, you see, here's another point. We have to avoid 
compromise. We have to avoid. There is always the enticement of the world to undermine our commitment. To sort of meet the world halfway. To water down God's standard. Joshua warned them. You see, God didn't get rid of all the Canaanites right away. He could have. But he left them there as a test to Israel. It's not enough to choose the right. You must also reject the wrong. You see, ultimately, God sets before us a choice. He tells us what to choose. He says to choose life. But we have to not only choose the tree of life, we have to reject the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't just hustle Adam and Eve up to where they would hurry up and take the tree of life before they had a chance to take anything else. He made the tree of life available. He offered it to them, but he made sure they were confronted with the necessity of having to reject the other. Israel was confronted with having to reject the ways of the Canaanite, the ways of the world. One of the dangers that has always beset the people of God is the danger of compromise, because that's the tendency of human nature. And what's the the remedy to that? We we saw right here. He says, "Be courageous to keep all that is to, to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses." See, ultimately, the truth, the Bible, the Word of God is our, is there to guard us. It's there to give us stability. We saw it at the beginning. We saw that that was the heart and core of the revival under Hezekiah. It was the heart and core of the revival under Josiah, the refinding of the book of the law. When Israel went forward to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land, What went before them was the ark containing the truth, containing the the tables of the covenant, containing the book of the law. We find that over and over, this was there to help the people of God. God told them as they stood at a, as they stood at this point, that they had to reject the world around them. And they did so by choosing to follow what God said. That if they went back, they would invite many problems to themselves. In chapter 24, Joshua gathered all the tribes to Shechem. And he began to rehearse the history. And he said in verse 2, Joshua said, this is Joshua 24, 2. Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt of old time beyond the river, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed. And I've done all these things, and he rehearses the story. In verse 12, I sent the hornet before you and drove them out, the two kings of the Amorites, not with your sword nor with your bow. Verse 13, I gave you a land whereon you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell therein of vineyards and olive yards, which you have not planted, yet you eat of them. Now, therefore, verse 14, fear the eternal and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve you the eternal. If it seems evil to you to serve the eternal, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the eternal. We will serve the eternal. Fear God and serve him in sincerity and truth. You see, ultimately, that is what God requires. Josiah turned to God with all his heart. With all his heart. He served God from the heart. That's what God asks of all of us. That's what we're told in the New Testament. Paul told the Corinthians that they were to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness. Not just the leavened bread, uh, the physical leavened bread, but they were to put away the leavening of malice and wickedness and to partake of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
Well, we heard about sincerity and truth in the Son of Man. God requires both. We're to fear the eternal and serve him in sincerity and truth. We're not to look back to what we left behind us from conversion. We're not to look at what the world has to offer. We're not to derive our means of worshiping God from the society around. We're to worship God according to the pattern that he has established, and we're to do so from the heart. God's requirements are very consistent. Old Testament and New Testament. We're here on a day that celebrates victory. It celebrates the victory of the people of God because as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 11 catalogs the men and women of faith, uh, those who believed God and therefore acted upon that belief. Hebrews 12 tells us that we're encompassed with a great cloud of witnesses, all of these men and women of God who went before, who believed God, who trusted God. And we're told, Look at this crowd of witnesses. Look at all of these men and women who've lived their lives in faith. Don't be overcome by the adversities and the discouragements and the overwhelming odds. Rather, we're told in Hebrews 12 to look to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And therein lies the answer as to why there are two holy days in the seven day feast of unleavened bread. You see, it takes a miracle to start us out. And it takes a miracle to get us through. It takes a miracle from start to finish to enable us to go forward, to conquer, to win. God has called us to win. He's called us to conquest. He's called us to be conquerors, to be overcomers. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one to whom we must look. And therefore, we have to lift up the feeble knees and the hands that hang down to realize we haven't been called just to run the hundred yard dash. We've been called to a marathon. We've been called to endure to the end. But we haven't been called to endure to the end on our own strength and by our own power. God has called us to be winners. And in this book of Joshua, we have certainly parallels and keys that can help us to see what is necessary to be a spiritual conqueror. And ultimately, it gets back to turning to God with all our heart and mind and soul. God's Word, the Bible, is at the heart and core of any spiritual revival because that's the, that's the source to which we must turn. There's where the truth is contained. And as we turn to it, and we study God's Word, but not just study it in an academic sense, but study it with a surrendered, committed heart and mind, eschewing compromise, but having a depth of commitment, and realizing that the one we serve, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, you know, Paul tells us in Romans 8, how shall he not he also, which which so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, how shall he not much more with him also freely give us all things? You think God made the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave himself for us? Not then to follow through and give us what we need to make it. But it requires our effort. It requires our energy. But it also requires God's power. Brethren, brethren, we're here to celebrate a very special day. We're here to celebrate a special time. And we must never lose sight of the calling God has given us and of the victory that he offers.